that's BMTG. See also the nifty text overlaid on your screen right now. Uh, we do magic text on the internet. That's what we're doing right now, actually. Um, I've been asked a lot, a lot, about hedron alignment or hedron alignment. Turns out you can say it both ways. It doesn't matter. Um, I've been asked a lot about it, and there's general sort of buzz about this in a lot of deck building circles. So today, what I've decided to do is another how to build, and we're going to focus on hedron alignment in standard for this one. There are definitely ways of doing this in modern, I would imagine, and probably even legacy. But we're focus on standard, that's the cheapest way of doing it, and probably the way that we will have the most success. Try to take this to a modern term and see what happens. Um, who knows? But I think standard is the way that we can have the most success with doing it. So, let's first take a look at sort of the cards that no matter what we're doing, I'm going to show you three different decks today. Hey, Igby. But no matter what we do, we have to play a certain sort of shell. So, Take a look at those. Well, let's get this out of the way. We have to talk about Hedron Alignment, right? You know, it's the whole deck. Um, first of all, something jumps out at me when I first read the card. We need to see all four copies of Hedron Alignment somewhere during the game. You know, we have to put one in exile. We have to put one in the graveyard, one in our hand, and have one in play. That's a lot of work to have to do, and it means that you'll have to get to every single copy at some point in the game. And multiple copies of it you'll have to manipulate in some form or fashion. That's a lot of hoops to jump through. There's a couple of different ways of doing it. Some people think, you know, let's try and make a combo deck out of this and do it as quickly as possible with cards like Tigem Scheming, things like that. But I just don't think there's a viable path to victory doing that in standard right now. We just don't have the options for it. We can't cycle through the deck fast enough while protecting ourselves. So what do we do? I think the better way to do it is to play a deck that goes long and draws a lot of its cards, you know? It sounds a lot like control to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you three different decks today with Hedron Alignment. And all of them have some sort of control aspect, either removing a lot of creatures, countering spells, or doing a little bit of both. So I think it's probably the best way to go, especially considering we have some really good options in control right now. And another thing is that it's Scry, the Scry there on um, Hedron Alignment, is really conducive to a control deck, especially considering if they haven't done anything, it's the end of their turn, you know, you haven't had to counter a spell or remove a creature. You can always Scry as many times as you have the mana for if you feel like it, and that can really help set up your next turn even just scrying one. People don't even look at that scry ability on Hedron Alignment. It's actually very, very important. So, yeah, just another thing that lends itself to control play, but there are definitely some other things that we have to play in the shell of the deck here, so let's take a look. A couple of things I want to talk about here first are Dig Through Time and Treasure Cruise. These are sort of must-play cards because, you know, we're obviously in blue. We're playing Hedron Alignment. We have to see a lot of our cards. Both of these cards allow us to do that, and they allow us to delve away any Hedron Alignments in our graveyard already so we can get that Exile Clause down. So this checks off multiple boxes for us. Weird stuff here, but I do think that this has a place in the shell of any deck that I've made so far. Both Oath of Jace and Monastery Siege are cards that both draw us cards. We know that's important and allow us to pitch a Hedron Alignment into our graveyard. Pretty important. We actually, the way we're doing it here in all of these decks, have to pitch two Hedron Alignments into the graveyard over the course of the game because we want to delve one away and have one in the graveyard. That's pretty important. So stuff that lets us discard cards is cool. And these also draw the cards. That's awesome. And these have been pretty much indispensable in any Hedron Alignment deck that I've tried to build in this standard. And the last thing I want to talk about in the shell here, and I'll give you this, two out of the three decks I'll give you today don't include this card for budgetary concerns, but it just is what it is. A great card for this deck is Jace Varen's Prodigy. If you want to make a competitive version of the deck, this definitely goes in allowing you to recast key instants and sorceries and things like that, like Dig Through Time, that's important, and other things that you play, removal and stuff like that, and allowing you to discard. You know, drawing is good, discarding is good because we can pitch, uh, pitch Hedron Alignment. So, everything Chase does is pretty much amazing for the deck, and he even provides some defense, and he's even another way of winning the game. So, if you've got the dollars, or if you had the horse sense to go ahead and invest in Jace when he was just a few bucks, this is definitely the deck you want to use him in. But, but again, don't panic. I've got ways of doing this without him. Well, that's sort of all the cards that I wanted to sort of spotlight, sort of the things I think belong in the basic shell for the deck. But what are some ways that we can build decks around these cards here? Well, the first deck I want to show you is just a sort of budget blue-black control build. The base of the deck, 35 cards without the lands or anything, just going to cost you about 35 bucks, a dollar a card on average. That's not too bad. If you add the Jaces, it'll cost you a lot more. And once you add Fetches to the mana base, that'll cost you an extra $100 or so. So you're still without the Jace is looking at under $150 for this blue-black Hedron Alignment Control deck. But let's go through it real quick because it's pretty basic here. We're obviously going to play four copies of Hedron Alignment 
Don't have to talk about that too much. We need the card. But we're going to play four copies of Oath of Jace and four copies of Monastery Siege. Now, if you have the Jaces, I would definitely suggest replacing the Monastery Siege with your Jaces. But Monastery Siege in this deck, much, much cheaper choice, obviously. And still, you know, pretty slowly. But still accomplishes a lot of the same things. You know, drawing and discarding cards so that we can get to the Hedron alignments and then pitch them into the graveyard. This is just sort of static here. Four alignment, four oath, four Monastery Siege. That'll pop up a lot here. Um, so definitely play those. I already explained why we want to do that. But we also want to counter spells and remove creatures. So let's talk about some counter spells here. We're going to play three copies of Clash of Wills and two copies of Void Shatter. Clash of Wills really helps in the early game. It's a great just two or three, you know, second or third turn play against whatever they're trying to do to establish board position. Clash of Wills is even good a little bit later on in the game because honestly, a two or three minute Clash of Wills is going to do the job for you up until the fifth turn a lot of the time. So Clash of Wills is sort of a catch-all that's going to do a lot of work for you as far as countering spells. And then Void Shatter, we're obviously in a format with Tassiger, Den Protector, Jace, all of this stuff that gets stuff out of the graveyard, Koligon's Command, or Jutai's command. So something like Void Shatter is really desirable right now. Not to mention, I have to say that there's a trick here. If you just can't get, for whatever reason, a Hedron alignment into an exile, you can always cast one out of your hand and Void Shatter it. <laughs> Thus, it will go into exile. You can do that if you have six mana available and no options as far as exiling one. You've got the rest of it set up. It's a thing that happens. We've got our counterspell game down here, but we also have to remove creatures so that we can control things that sort of slip through the cracks. There will be some things. <laughs> so we're going to play four Grasp of Darkness in my deck here. Or you can go three Grasp and maybe one Ultimate Price depending on your meta. If you see a lot of Atarka Red and, you know, monocolored creatures basically. You can always play Ultimate Price over Grasp of Darkness. But only as like a one or two of, you know. But definitely you want to have four copies of two mana removal in the deck. That's very important. We're also going to play three Murderous Cut. This does double duty, allowing us to, again, exile a Hedron alignment. Um, great option for that too, you know, being able to remove one of their best, or their best guy, basically, and put an Hedron alignment into exile, great. Murderous Cut, actually a very important card to play if we're in black. It just does everything we want it to do. Um, we're going to play two copies of Languish. We need some sort of mass removal in the deck. Very important, um, especially at sort of this budget level, and at locals, that we're able to remove a bunch of creatures all at once. So Languish, again, a must, especially considering we're a control deck that wants to go long. Um, we're playing one copy to finish off the removal of Ruinous Path. That's 10 solid, you know, removal elements. And I like the Ruinous Path not only because it's a creature late in the game, that can be important, but because it also removes Planeswalkers, which is something that we need to be able to remove too. It's just a solid piece of removal. Into these sort of incidentals here, the stuff that rounds out the deck, I definitely play two copies of Despise, which is almost removal. You could categorize it as that. It's really good against pretty much every deck in the format. You know, a lot of decks that don't even play that many creatures will play like Jace, you know, and pretty much most decks are creature-based to begin with anyway. So something like Despise can be really good, whether you're getting Anafenzers or Siege Rhinos or Manus Riders, Jaces or even Ulamogs and stuff out of their hand. And it's just good, good all-around card, and we can easily pull off you know, turn one Despise. We only have the two colors here, not many of the things coming to play tap, so yeah, definitely I think Despise is a great option. We're playing four Dig Through Time, that's sort of part of, that's honestly part of the shell right there, you know. Dig Through Time is just, we're gonna definitely play it alongside Murderous Cut allows us to exile Hedron alignments, and we get to see a bunch of cards, so Dig Through Time. And to round out the main deck, I'd play at least the one copy of Tassiger here. Tassiger would allow you to get Hedron alignments back from your graveyard in the, you know, the off chance you'd ever need to do that. And it also allows you to return counter spells and removal and stuff to your hand. And it's also another way of winning the game in a pinch. You know, four or five body is pretty good if you've got the board under control. So you can just sort of win in five turns through swinging. So, you know, that's, that's not bad at all just to have another option of doing that. But mostly we need him for his graveyard recursion ability and the fact that again he has delve which is good with what we're trying to do here so Tassiger I think is probably also a must play as far as this deck is concerned definitely play him for the purposes of time because I'm giving you three decks I'm not going to go through a whole land base for each deck I'm just going to tell you we're playing 26 lands in this deck it's pretty important to play Polluted Delta and Sunken Hollow not to mention we could play like Seagate Wreckage that allows us to see more cards maybe that would work but I'm not totally sold um, but really, it's important to play fetch lands so that we thin our deck, thus giving us better chances of seeing more Hedron alignments when we do draw cards. So, fetch lands, although expensive, are fairly important. And I'm not going to do sideboards for the deck right now. At the end of the video, I'll give you some sort of important sideboard options that we really should play. 
Overall, this first deck right here is pretty darn good for what it's trying to do. It's only a few bucks to build overall. Like I said, with the fetch lands, you'll get out of there under 150. And if you don't play the fetches and you just opt for like Evolving Wilds, you get out of there for well under 100, maybe like 50 bucks even. That's not bad for a fairly fun deck. And if you just wanted to build a version of it to try it out and see how you liked it, I think it's a good base version to build. There's no super duper like crazy tricks or anything. Very straightforward control with a very basic win condition. So if you're just testing the waters to see how much you want to play the deck, this can be a good place to start and it's super cheap. Deck number two is slightly more complex, but it's not going to cost you but like $10 or $15 more than the first deck that I just gave you. And it's pretty unique. It's got something cool going for it here. Now, Hatred Alignment, that's an enchantment. So is Monastery Siege, so is Oath of Jace. So, we could do a blue-white Starfield Alignment deck. That would be cool, and this deck has actually been a lot of fun to test. This is my favorite deck of the three that I've given you so far, but I'm really weird and I like stupid decks. But, this deck does perform well. Got a lot of good removal options and another path to victory in Starfield of Nyx. You know, we're playing a lot of enchantments, and if we can control the board well enough with some removal, then we can definitely just swing in for the win late game if we can't get our alignments set up. So, let's take a look. We're going to play the sort of basic blue enchantment shell that I've already shown you here. Four Hedron Alignment, four copies of Monastery Siege, and four Oath of Jace. The play set of each of these, they're all enchantments, all important to play, and definitely in the Starfield deck I wouldn't leave out any of these. So, yes, just definitely. Just the three copies of Starfield of Nyx. We're drawing a lot of cards, we have a lot of removal, so we're going to draw into it if we just play the three copies you know, fairly reliably. So even though it's sort of the cornerstone of the deck, we can play three copies and get away with it all day. We don't want it clogging up our hand or anything, so definitely want to play it, but I wouldn't play the full playset or anything. One copy of Sigil of the Empty Throne, just another way of winning the game. You know, we got a huge alignment, we can swing through with all of our guys when Starfield is turned on, or we can just win off of Sigil of the Empty Throne. I just like to have another path to victory, and this is fairly reliable. In this deck we're playing like 29 enchantments, so yeah, let's just play the one copy of Sigil to, to hedge our bets a little. We're playing 12 total enchantments that in some way control the board for us here. We're playing the four copies of Silk Wrap and four copies of Stasis Snare that we're definitely going to have to play. Um, both of these just super obvious, you know, Silk Wrap we need something to control the board early game a lot, so I play the, this, all four copies. And then the four copies of Stasis Snare are definitely a must too in the sideboard, or even in the main deck, I would also play Suspension Field. Um, just guaranteed, yes, definitely. Suspension Field is also very good, and you could, could play the main deck if you wanted. I just like having the instant speed option of a Stasis Snare, but just all removal of that is that are also enchantments, so work with Starfield, just yes. Really on that same train, I'd also play two copies of Pacifism and two copies of Quarantine Field. You could play more copies of Quarantine Field. I just think with Silk Wrap and Stasis Snare and the maybe addition of Suspension Field somewhere in the deck that it sort of thins the you know need to play Pacifism, but I'd still try and slip it in there somewhere as a one or two up. And definitely play Quarantine Field. This can be really, really, really good. And I'd play one Planar Outburst, sort of to round out the removal. Not an enchantment or anything, but before your Starfield is turned on, this can be really good. It's not so great after your Starfield is turned on because you don't want to lose your Silk Wraps and Stasis Snares and stuff like that. It kind of sucks, but before your Silk Wrap is turned, before your um, Starfield of Nyx is turned on, this can just be a great mass removal tool, which the deck is sort of lacking, so I've slipped it in. And in this deck, I'd play four copies of Dig Three Time and two copies of Treasure Cruise. We don't have the option of playing Murderer's Cut or Tasker in this deck to give us another delve option, you know, so we need as many cards that can put a Hedron Alignment into Exile as possible. So, and this is just a we draw a bunch of cards with these, so yes, definitely. We're going to play 25 lands in this version of the deck. I think we can get away with playing one less land in here because we're not as controlling. We don't have counter magic. We're not doing as much at the end of their turn. We don't need our drops as much, you know, even though we're playing five drops in the deck. We can definitely reliably cast five drops off 25 lands. We're just not as controlling. I think we can play one fewer lands. Overall, the deck is weird, but I've already said it's my favorite deck that I'm going to show you today. But it's just because it's, you know, it's fairly unique. I've always liked Starfield of Nyx. And since we're playing so many enchantments in sort of the basic shell of the deck, I figured why not try Starfield? And we've got a lot of different options for removal in our enchantments right now. So, turns out it works. And the last deck I'm going to bring you is sort of the competitive build. This is Esper Alignment, we're calling it. Just, you know, blue, white, black, Hedron Alignment. Got a lot of good options in Esper. It's proven to be the best control deck in the format. 
um, for the last, God knows how long, six, eight months, you know? So, um, yeah, why not try it with hedron alignment? Just slip alignments into your standard Esper Control deck. Let's see how that works. We're obviously going to play four copies of Hedron Alignment in the deck. I've cut it down to two copies of both of Jace and four copies of Jace himself. With Jace around, it's just not as important to play Siege or really even Oath, although Oath has decent synergy with Jace. That's pretty cool, too. But all in all, we've got plenty of ways with just these six cards here to dump a Hedron Alignment into our graveyard when need arises. So, and Jace, we finally get to play him in the deck. Just absolutely amazing. Most of the cards I'm going to show you coming up, you can recast with Jace, and that can be pretty important to recast like a Dig Through Time or a Languish with Jace. So, he's, he is very good. As far as counter magic goes in this deck, I would play three copies of Clash of Will and three copies of Void Shatter. And some people might want to play Disdainful Stroke in the main deck or even Dispel so we have a main deck way of getting past something like Dramoka's Command. Although Dramoka's Command isn't super powerful against this, it just puts one in our graveyard for us, whatever, we don't care. Um, <laughs> he drew a line. But in any case, Dispel wouldn't be bad. Disdainful Stroke is also a decent card, and I would definitely include it in every single sideboard. But I think Void Shatter is just a premium counterspell in the format, especially with the amount of things that get stuffed out of the graveyard. I really, really like Void Shatter. It's just a catch-all. Same with Clash of Wills. I've already explained why that's so good to me in this format. And Clash of Wills might actually be, like, the best counterspell in the format. So you play these, definitely. We've got another 10 removal options in this deck, but I think we've just got better removal options overall. So let's go over these. We've got three copies of Grasp of Darkness in the deck. Grasp of Darkness, just obviously you play that. And of course, you could also split the difference to Grasp, one ultimate price, if that's what you felt like doing. The same thing goes here, but you definitely play a two mana instant speed removal spell. Along with that, you'll play two copies of Silk Wrap, I think, in the deck. Just another, just get rid of that Hangerback Walker, or Jace, or Anathenza, or Manus Rider, or whatever, forever. That's just important to be able to do that. Um, and two copies of Murderous Cut I'd play for the same reasons. You know, we've got a lot of stuff that delves in the deck. Murderous Cut is just a very important option. We delve away at Heatron Alignment and take care of their best guy. Like I said before, um, we've got two copies of Utter In. I think it's more important to play this than Ruinous Path if we have access to white. Because um, it takes out not just Planeswalkers and creatures, but a lot of stuff. Anything not land. So, yeah, Utter End is ridiculous, and if I had more slots, I'd play three copies. The card is really, really good. And I hate that it's about two. Die. That sucks. Um, but one copy of Languish in the deck, we can definitely play more, you know, big mass removal in the sideboard. And if you're, you know, if an eye toward aggro locos, uh, locals, I'd probably play more copies of this. But in a really competitive version, you're taking to the Grand Prix, which I don't even know that I'd suggest doing that. But, you know, Esper Dragon is just better. But if you were to be so inclined, then I would probably play um, just the one language in the main and then support that with more mass removal in the side. Um, aside from that, I'm just going to play, and that's pretty much all the removal in the deck, but I would play one copy of a Jutai's Command, which sort of goes into the counter magic, but also gains us life against aggro, draws us cards, which we've established is good, counters big creatures, that's pretty awesome, we don't like big creatures, and gets Jace back from the graveyard. So just, I think one copy of a Jutai's Command is probably imperative with all the stuff that it does. Just a couple of creatures here. I played two copies of Tassiger in this deck for the same reasons I'm playing in the first one. You know, we like to delve things away. We like to get things back from our graveyard, too. So I think two Tassiger's great. The body on him is awesome. He can win the game for you. And speaking of things that can win the game for you, just the one copy of Ojutai. Really, really good sort of surprise. Finisher, you know, great to have on the board at, at pretty much any time. Even if you're still trying to win off of Hedron alignment, you know, and this swings in and does combat damage, this will allow you to anticipate, you know, you'll look at the top three cards and put target Hedron alignment into your hand, you know, that's pretty good right there. Anything that allows us to dig through cards is really, really good, and a Jutai does that five damage at a time, so another way to win the game and even have synergy with the strategy, so yeah, one, one of Jutai I think is definite. And I played 26 lands in this one. Considering there's three colors, you get to play even more fetch lands. And again, fetch lands I think are very important in thinning our deck so that we have better chances of drawing into a Hedron alignment. So, but definitely play 26 in this really controly long game deck. I'm going to quickly run through some sideboard options. I've already talked about Dispel and Disdainful Stroke. I think those are both premium sideboard options in the deck. Dispel protecting us against all kinds of stuff, including Dramoka's Command. Very good card. And same thing goes with um, Disdainful Stroke. Just super important against all the huge cards that people play right now, which there's an awful lot of. Um, Duress and Despise are also both great, great sideboard cards. Duress is especially good. Despise protects us 
against creatures. Um, so yeah, both both very good. Um, ultimate prize I've brought up that could be sideboarded. Hallowed Moonlight. We can play that. We have access to the colors in, in all but one of these decks. How Moonlight good against the Rising Tide of Collected Company decks? Um, Surge of Righteousness, everyone plays that. Everyone knows that's good. Um, Erishing Cleric is another sideboard card that we could play to great effect. A good blocker that will give us some life early game. Planar Outburst and um, um, just, again, good Master Removal. Infinite Obliteration can be good against a lot of different things, but especially the ramp decks in the format. Um, Sphinx's Tutelage could be a good card. And the Control Mirror, ensuring that we don't deck with all the cards we're drawing. And then maybe Virulent Plague could definitely... Very, very good against the onslaught of tokens-based decks. Not just Gideon and Hordling Outburst, but lots of other things out there right now. So those are sort of all the quick sideboard options that I would suggest looking through if you're building a sideboard for really any of these decks. Well, that's all I've got for right now. I'm pretty sure I'm tapped out here. That's three different decks. Let me know which one you like best, or if you have an idea for how to make Hedron Alignment work that I didn't touch on here, I'm all ears. I'd really like to know how we can break this deck in standard. What's happening next time and what's in the works? Well, next time I think I might actually want to touch on White Black Eldrazi. That's a deck that I haven't talked about in a while here, and I think it's actually really, really actually super strong in the format. I've been testing it for a while now, um, and like Thought Not Seer, the addition of that is just ridiculous. So, yeah, yeah, and Eldrazi Displacer actually goes in White like Eldrazi to great effect too. So I'm thinking about doing that next time, but I've also got plans here. I'm trying to get four color super friends and standard to work. There's a lot of different ways to build it and it's sort of clunky um, every, time, every time I've tried to build it so far, but I'm working on it, trying to get the, the kinks out here. But something I think you might be excited about me working on, I'm working very hard, I've gotten all the material written, just that editing is going to be a pain, but I think you might be excited to hear about it, is an introduction to or metagame analysis of the Popper format. I've been a huge fan of Popper for a while now, and I've neglected talking about it on the channel so much because I don't think, or didn't think, it was very popular. But lately, I've been getting a lot of requests to talk about Popper. So let me know how you feel about that. Just sort of metagame analysis or guide to, you know, beginner's guide to Popper. Been working on that for a while. So let me know how you feel. That's everything right now. If you enjoyed the content, like, share, comment, subscribe to all the YouTube stuff. I'm Dev from SBMTG, as usual. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Right, Igby? Thanks. They're good people for watching the videos. All of love.